Welcome to the Mets Pod. On today's show, we have a great guest as Mets VP of Amateur and International Scouting, Tommy Tanis, joins us to talk MLB Draft as the Mets have two first-round picks in this year's event. But before we get to Tommy, we got to recap a tremendous performance from Max Scherzer to take Game 1 in Atlanta, the future of the lineup, and much more. Reminder to subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you can watch on SMY's YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mets Pod. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined, as always, by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. And we got a loaded show for you today as Mets VP of International and Amateur Scouting, Tommy Tanis, is going to join us in just a bit. But before we get there, got to start with the latest as the Mets take Game 1 in Atlanta behind an incredible start from Max Scherzer and the offense uh, not really exploding, but getting the job done followed by a huge lockdown performance by Edwin Diaz. So, Joe, let's bring you in here. This is what you pay Max Scherzer to do. Max is a guy that is equipped for the biggest moments, and this was by far his biggest moment wearing a Mets uniform. Although it's just July, there's a lot of baseball left, this series has been circled on the calendar, it feels like, for the last three weeks. While the Mets have played some good teams and some bad teams and Atlanta has beat up on largely not so good teams. It was like, all right, the Mets and Braves have 15 left against each other starting on July 11th. And like you said, that's exactly what I was going to say. An outing, the outing that Max Scherzer had last night is why you pay Max Scherzer $43 million a year to come in. He comes in in a big spot against a big division rival that they're surging. And the Mets aren't exactly struggling per se, but they're just... They're just playing okay. They're they're treading water. And the Mets are showing that while Atlanta is very good, so are they. And, you know, there's still two, two more games to go, but that is exactly what you pay Max Scherzer to do. Yeah, I think the mental makeup was on full display for Max, right? When you look at it going into a place that traditionally we know the Mets have struggled in recent years, Honestly, the craziest thing in all of this, Scherzer has been so dominant that his numbers are still good against Atlanta, but traditionally that is a team that he does not always shut down when you look at his career numbers. They are one of the only franchises that have given him uh, some trouble in the past. So Scherzer comes in, we have two starts off of the oblique injury, Joe, and he looks like himself. He looks like prime Scherzer, nine strikeouts against Atlanta, seven innings. Really, the only mistake was the one pitch that he left up for Austin Riley and something that you and I have talked a lot about off air. This is the Braves. They are going to hit their home runs. But if you keep guys off base and force them into a solo home run here, a solo home run there, you're going to get your strikeouts. You can pitch deep into games like we saw Scherzer. His pitch count was low going deep into that one last night. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, Joe. But when the Mets go out and give Scherzer over $40 million a year, you're thinking for games like this, you're thinking for games like October, Max Scherzer is absolutely built for this and worth every single penny. He's built for this, and he's proven that by pitching very well in the playoffs when Washington won the World Series. Um, he pitched well for the Dodgers before you know shutting down for, for a couple starts there in, in the, the NLCS, I believe. But he's built for this. I think Jacob DeGrom is of the same exact ilk that he's built for this. And yep. he's, you know, you've, you saw him in 2015, of course. But he's a guy that he's working his way back. He's going to start for AAA Syracuse on Thursday. And I think they might do one more rehab start after that. But we're getting close to that dream that it feels like we've been talking about for two years. It's been more like seven months, but... Uh, it feels like it's been a long time that it's like we're going to see Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom back-to-back. And it's a very exciting time with the trade deadline coming up. And, yeah, the, the Mets are the Mets are right there. I think they're where they need to be. Joe, let me throw, throw you something at that we didn't really plan for that they talked about in the broadcast in the first game with Keith. Now, obviously, you'd love to have them for as many games as possible. But is there something in this world of – arms especially veteran arms or young arms often injured that if the Mets can get DeGrom truly back for the second half of the year Scherzer missing 
nearly two months, DeGrom missing the first half of the year, that they have even more in the tank and in this weird world because the Mets have not just treaded water without them for the most part. The Mets have played 20 games over 500 for the better part of the season. That this can be an advantage to them, having those guys be a little bit more fresh at their age than they typically would be from the long haul of an MLB season? I actually think yes. Uh, when you think about like innings limits and things like that, that's typically reserved for younger players that haven't had a lengthy history of throwing a lot of innings. Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer are two guys that have thrown 200 plus innings nearly every year of their career that they've been healthy. Obviously, DeGrom's been out for a while, but I think he's going to be coming back fresh. I mean, what I've seen in the rehab start so far, he just looks like Jacob DeGrom. Vintage. I mean, he's, he's throwing 98 to 101. Yeah. Uh, the slider is crisp and it's in the low 90s. So I think the freshness of DeGrom's arm and Scherzer, he injured the oblique, obviously. So his arm just kind of got a rest and there was nothing wrong with it. So I think that's a great point, and I think it's definitely something that has a chance to be advantageous for him as we go through the net, you know, the last two months of the season and leading into what is seemingly more and more likely an October run. Yeah, when you look around baseball right now, it's fascinating how many of the contenders have vital pieces in their rotation that have never done this before, that they're going to have the, and Mets fans are familiar with this. They went through it a little bit with Matt Harvey many years ago, where it was a question of, you know, when do you cut off the innings limit? So that could be an advantage for the Mets down the stretch. All right, let's get into a little bit of an unsung hero of game one. Obviously, a lot of the attention is around Max Scherzer, but Luis Guillorme hitting a rare home run, not just a home run for Luis, but a, a moonshot for Luis. As soon as it left the bat, it felt like it was going out of the stadium and it, it, it flew. Uh, Guillorme has been really incredible this year, Joe. Defensively, we know what Guillorme is. We've watched him play for a long time. And we know the kind of hands and the agility he has in the field to make quick twitch plays. But the bat has come alive this year, Joe. He has been a consistent hitter. I know he had the slump, and Gelbs mentioned the cut on his hand that's finally healing. But he's hitting over 300. Obviously, you'll take the power when you can get it. But at what point, Joe, especially with Eduardo Escobar struggling, is Guillaume fighting for majority of the playing time at either third base or time at second base? Or he's just always out there in a different position to give guys a break. Luis Guillorme clearly has Darren O'Day's number. Both of his home runs this year have come off of Darren O'Day. So uh, whenever they face Atlanta, if O'Day is uh, coming into the game, make sure you get Guillorme up in that spot if you can. Which is odd because uh, a guy like yeah. O'Day, hitters usually struggle to see the ball coming yeah. out of his hand. Yeah, I don't know, but sometimes... Strange. It, Guillorme sometimes is a strange player. He's a strange player and baseball is a strange sport. Uh, but as far as the everyday type of play, I think it's at the point where Luis Guillerme has to be getting, at minimum, a split with Eduardo Escobar once yep. Jeff McNeil returns. And obviously, if the day you put Escobar in, if McNeil is going to play the outfield that day, you could play Guillerme at second. But one thing we've seen with Luis, and I do think his offensive game has stepped up this year, when he is playing every day, he'll be really good for a spurt of time. But then he kind of goes into a funk, which leads me to believe is it's kind of what he is, right? He's a super utility guy that you can play for his hot streaks, but he's not, you know, I, I'm trying to think the best way to say this, not the best hitter in the world where you're going to be, you know, no doubt, throw him out there every day and he's going to hit. But ride this hot streak, especially while Eduardo Escobar is struggling. So once, once McNeil gets back, I'd like to see much more Guillaume at third base. Yeah, I'm with you. My take on Guillaume is I think it's easier to play him every day with the defensive boost that he brings, the contact approach that he brings, working long counts, getting on base at over a 380 clip right now. It's easier to have him in the lineup every day, giving you all of those things, but sacrificing pop and power, barring Darren O'Day is not on the mound, when you're getting more out of the DH spot, which is not Luis Guillaume's fault. The problem is right now we have this issue that they're not getting anything, and, I, and this is a great transition point really to get right into the offense, as much as this is a positive pod this week, right? You take game one from Atlanta, huge from Max Scherzer. There's a lot of great things going on around the organization right now, but there still has to be, the Mets are thinking big picture here right now. The Mets are not thinking, hey, we're 20 games over 500. This is awesome. I think the Mets came into this season thinking we can win a World Series. They have done enough in the first half of the year. 
But now, something you and I always talk about as we cover this team in depth during the offseason is, what are your holes? Every team goes into the offseason with holes. Do those holes become magnified the first half of the year? And if they do, you address them at the deadline. With the Mets, we know they're going to get relief help at the deadline. But with the Mets, we also know that they need pop in this lineup somewhere. And there is a wide open spot at DH for somebody to play every day, get four at-bats every single day. And I, Joe, I think that goes back to the Guillaume conversation. It's easier to have him in the lineup if somebody that's DHing is giving you 25 home runs a year, but they're not getting anything even in that stratosphere with Dom Smith and J.D. Davis right now. Yeah, there's no way around it. Dom Smith and J.D. Davis are just not playing well at all. And, you know, Dom's been a little better since he came back from AAA. Sure. Uh, but still, you don't feel like they're going to be impactful. And when you look at a lot of lineups throughout baseball – you, you look at their designated hitter spot, and you're like, there's a slugger. And the Mets right now are, I believe, 29th in the league in OPS from their designated hitter position. So I would predict I mean, last, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I hate to say so, it. Yeah. Is so that all just, from Pete? It's all from Pete's days, DHing. It's pretty much largely all from Pete. So they, they've been very, very, very poor at DH. So there's no question that's going to be a priority. Um, the question's going to be, who is actually available? We know the Nationals are going to be selling off a guy like Josh Bell, a guy like Nelson Cruz, who it seems like father time is kind of catching up to. You knew it would eventually happen. Uh, it seems like that's starting to happen. But over the next couple weeks, I would say that, that's really going to clarify itself. Who are the sellers? Who's available? And who can the Mets get for the right prospect return that's going to provide the impact that they want? Because I think... One thing that is important to note, the trade last year that the Mets made for Javi Baez and Trevor Williams, giving up Pete Crow Armstrong, they can't be making moves like that anymore. You know, it's gave up a guy like Crow Armstrong, who's going to be at the Futures game this weekend, is considered like a top 70 prospect in baseball now. And the Mets, all they really got out of it was a kind of fake run at a playoff spot and a spot starter who's been valuable in Trevor Williams. But you have to be smart with what prospects you're trading. And I think the DH is a spot that you're going to be able to upgrade without parting with something significant. Yeah, I think that's totally a fair point. It's going to be interesting to see how they handled the deadline. You brought up Josh Bell, uh, Nelson Cruz. I think the lower tier versions of those guys, Joe, that I've come across are a player the Mets fans are familiar with in Brandon Drury, who they just saw on the Reds. He's having a career year. And then maybe a guy like Daniel Vogelback on Pittsburgh right now. He's had a really nice season for them. The thing is, he he really mashes against righties, and I think the Mets are have shown themselves to be a team that they need help against left-handed yeah. pitching as well. Maybe they'll acquire two bats and, and platoon them at DH like they're already doing with J.D. and Dom, just trying to get more impactful players. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they go in that route. But all right, guys, now we're excited to have on Mets VP of Amateur and International Scouting, Tommy Tanis. Tommy, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So, Tommy, we're obviously really excited to have you on, talk about an MLB draft that's huge for the Mets. But general outlook, each class gets a, you know, a little bit of a reputation, whether it's a top-heavy class, whether it's known as a deeper draft. Um, from all the work you've put into this year's, how would you describe this year's MLB draft? Yeah, it's a nice blend. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the draft dynamic changed quite a bit uh, from the start of the year until now, simply because of the injuries with the pitching. Uh, I think last year we had nine college pitchers taken in the first round. I don't think we come near that number this year. I mean, traditionally it's about six or seven. Uh, and I think it'll actually be less than that uh, this year. So the dynamics of it changed, uh, but the depth of the, tra the draft is, is pretty high quality as far as position players go. Uh, some high school pitching at the top of the draft is very interesting. Uh, and there's still some college depth to it. So you mentioned the injuries to the pitching. Uh, I, I'd say this year is a bit unprecedented with the quantity of arms, both high school and college that underwent Tommy John. Uh, without getting to specific players, how do you go about evaluating a player who underwent surgery during their draft season? I mean, previously you guys drafted JT Ginn just two months post-surgery, but how do you go about that kind of evaluation? Yeah, it's, it, it does add a, a, another layer of difficulty 
um, to scouting the player when that player's not on the field to scout. Um, in JT Ginn's case, and, and it's a great example since we drafted him and he was a Tommy John, uh, <clears throat> Tommy John surgery. Uh, we had history with JT Ginn. So that plays a big part of it. Um, we had history with him going back to his junior year in high school, his senior year in high school, a full year, uh, he pitched as a freshman. So we were able to accumulate a lot of history and, and a lot of scouting grades, scouting reports, a lot of metrics with JT again. So that was helpful. The players that add a little more difficulty are the players that you lack history in, uh, whether it's on field history or simply they did not pitch in uh, college as much. And now you're lacking some statistics. You're lacking metrics in Rapsodo, in TrackMan, and you're trying to do this on video. So uh, certainly a little more difficult with less history you have, and, and you, you try and make it up with video, but it's never quite the same. The Mets have five of the first 90 picks, including two first rounders at 11 and 14. Uh, recently, scouting director Mark Tremuda noted in an interview that you guys may never have this opportunity again with this many high picks. Do you feel any additional pressure? I know he does. Given that, of, of course he does. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I find all of the drafts uh, in a good way. There's a lot of pressure. Um, and, and I mean that. That's what makes it fun. Uh, and, and it's a job and, and I get it. But uh, the pressure makes it worthwhile. Uh, I actually think there's more pressure when you have less picks. Uh, to, to make sure you hit those players. Uh, you know, we've had drafts where we haven't had a first rounder. We've had drafts where we've had a first rounder, didn't have a second rounder. Um, and it makes those pick, picks even more vital, even more impactful. But I, I appreciate the question. I, I, I get it. Uh, I don't think we'll have an opportunity to have uh, this multitude of picks. Now, I worked in Toronto. I think we had eight or nine picks in the first 90. And we've learned some lessons from that. And that was super fun. Uh, but there, there are also some dangers that you can fall into when you have multiple picks and, and the carelessness that you can get into where, well, it's nice to take a chance on this player now. It's nice to take a chance here. And you get away from your process. And that's a very dangerous thing that we have kept an eye on throughout the scouting season and building our boards up until this point. So, uh, yep, great opportunity. Uh, we need to cash in on that opportunity. Uh, the, the multiple picks are only as good as what you make them. Uh, as I've said to the staff over and over, we can have 20 picks if we don't get them uh, right and line them up on the board. You might as well have just had two really good picks. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a little pressure and I, and I get it. So follow up to that, Tommy, how many players do you typically or a range of players do you stack on the team's board? And does that change when it varies the kind of assets we joe said it this is an unprecedented year not just the two first rounders but the five picks in the top 90 does that change the overall range of players that you're adding to a board it does i i can't get into an exact number sure um uh, but yes uh be, because we're picking in you know five in the first 90 more players will be lined up on that board without giving us a, a, a specific number but more importantly it's you line up players on a board with what we call common looks. Um, and a common look would be myself seeing as many players as possible, along with Mark Tremuda and our regional and national cross checkers. So once you start running out of common looks, so I have a look at one player, Mark has a look at a player, we're comparing notes, we're comparing it to what our cross checkers have seen. Once you start running out of common looks is the best time to stop putting together a major board there. Um, and that's, that's dependent on weather, how many games you got to see. That depends on how big your staff is. Uh, are you able to get to these games? So a lot goes into to that, but sometimes it's determined, honestly, by scheduling and weather. So Mets fans are seeing the investments that Steve Cohen is making into the organization, starting at the top with the front office, the infrastructure, obviously the major league roster. It's now starting to trickle down to the player development level. And, you know, we often forget that he's only been here for two years, so he's accomplishing a lot in a short period of time. Is he someone that's interested in the draft process or is he kind of hands off here? 
very interested in all aspects of the organization. Uh, he touches all, all parts of the organization. Uh, yes, we've had discussions about the draft. Uh, last year we did. Uh, this year uh, we, we continue to do that. But um, yeah, he he obviously having uh, his resources has turned this organization really around very quickly. Uh, the, the things they're doing in player development is mind boggling. Uh, how quickly things have transformed down there. It's always been a good department. It's going on a, the next tier level um, in in Major League Baseball. So, yeah, and, and that filters down to the scouting department, too. When we ask for something, uh, we usually get it. That's, that's, a, that's a good feeling, I'm sure. Uh, so there was a study I saw on Twitter that ranked the organization's draft picks by war over the last 10 years. And the Mets were second in all of baseball. Uh, and you you and your scouting department have been largely intact here for that period of time. Uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk about your scouting staff and how much of a benefit is there to have that continuity within the staff? Well, uh, I'll take the second part of that question. Uh, continuity uh, for me is huge. Uh, you learn so much about each other, working with each other. You know the strengths and weaknesses of your staff. And there are weaknesses in every staff. Um and the conversations you have when you've worked with someone for so many years uh, are really more honest. You know, the, the conversations I, I would love to, you know, when I'm older, replay them in my head with myself and Mark Tremuda on two hour rides after I've seen a game in California and he's in Texas and the arguments we have and the discussions all in a healthy place of, look, I didn't see this. Uh, why are you saying he does this? He doesn't. And that's how you come to having successful drafts. Um, but it starts with Mark and his staff. Um, you know, I've known Mark for close to 20 years. You can't find a better scout. I'll put him up against anybody in the industry. Um, and, th and then others that have kind of grown up with us in the organization. Drew Toussaint is our assistant scouting director. Drew was a part-time scout with us. Drew played professional baseball. He started as a part-time scout in L.A., wowed us. As I, I remember saying to people, I said, this is like the best part-time scout I've ever come across. And I was a part-time scout way back when. We promoted him to full-time. We promoted him to a regional cross-checker. We promoted him to a national cross-checker. Now he's the assistant scouting director. Just a phenomenal – all in the meantime, he gets his master's degree. Um, then there's Brian Hayes, who is not even in our department now. He's now director of baseball development. Uh, he was our assistant scouting director, and Brian added so much uh, to what we were doing in the draft room. He was the guy you called at two in the morning um, when you needed something. His phone was never off. To see him succeed in the game, uh, so many others. Doug Thurman, uh, our national cross checker, when, when I got here, he was an area scout. Uh, we promoted Doug to national cross checker. He's done a phenomenal job. Just so many. John Hendricks we brought from uh, Wake Forest. He was running the lab in, at Wake Forest, one of the best technicians of pitching in the game. So, you know, we've been able to keep this group together for so long now uh, that we really feel comfortable. But the, the biggest thing is there's a huge growth mindset here, um, and we're constantly challenging each other. We talk so much on the show about the changes the organization has made, obviously, uh, financially, a lot of them down that path. But Tommy, what are some of the internal changes you have made or your staff has made as, you know, whether it's learning from previous picks or just that the game has changed so much over the last 10 years? Yeah, the game, the, the game has changed. The way we scout players, me personally, has started in 1996. Mark started in 1997. Uh, the game has changed so much, how we evaluate a hitter, how we evaluate a pitcher. The biomechanics alone, what what I used to look at to break down uh, uh, both a hitter and a pitcher pregame uh, and then during the game has changed entirely. I wouldn't scout the hitter the same way I do now as I did then. Uh, and then we have the advantage of um, – uh, analysts now, Ben Zosmer and his group, uh, Des McGowan works closely with us uh, on the analytical side. We, we we are able to get into the numbers much more in depth than we ever were before. It was something that I think this organization really needed. I think as far as 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 that goes, like the analytics has just gone boom yeah. uh, in the industry. We were probably not quite as equipped with it personnel wise 
uh, that that's another advantage that Steve Cohen has given us. Uh, now we have the personnel. We have dedicated people working just on the draft like Des McGowan uh, with Ben Zosmer uh, overseeing that. Uh, it, it's added a huge advantage to us. All right, last one here, Tommy. We could not have you on the show and not bring up Francisco Alvarez, especially with you as the VP of not just amateur scouting, but international scouting. That's where all the talk in this farm system is centered around right now. He's kind of hogged a lot of that hype and warranted praise. What was it in this organization that saw in him, you know, this rare ceiling? What has he done to already tap into that at such a young age? You know, he was one of the more developed hitters you will ever see at age wow. 14. He, he really was. It was immense physical maturity at that age. Chris Becerra, who's not with the organization, is now with the Red Sox, was the director of international scouting. Uh, he did really the great groundwork that's needed on a 14-year-old player. Steve Barningham, who is now the international director, was cross-checking internationally then, did a great job. I came down. So all three of us were, were scouting Francisco for many weeks, many months. Um, his physical maturity, basically, it's the lowest heart rate you'll ever find in a batter's box. Uh, I remember putting him up against some 22-year-olds at a workout uh, in the Dominican Republic, and these pitchers were former minor league pitchers throwing 90 to 92 against a 14 year old kid. And I'll tell you right now, you wouldn't put a 14 year old kid up against a 20 year old in your life. He handled it like it was just another day at the park, uh, not intimidated, crushing balls. I remember saying this is like watching a 21 year old here. I said, how is this possible? Um, and you know, his catching was really good. He could always throw. Uh, he had such energy. That That's the best thing when you watch Francisco, not just his physical ability. You go to a minor league game, you watch him, you can feel it come off him. How he loves the game, how enthusiastic he is, how he wants to win. Uh, so it's not only special talent, it's special makeup. I think people can't wait to see that at City Field one day. Tommy Tanis, VP of Amateur and International Scouting. We love having you on the show. Love chopping it up with you. Thanks so much, and good luck with what's going to be a crazy MLB draft this year for the Mets. Thank you. Pleasure being on. All right, great stuff from Tommy as the Mets approach. A monumental draft for them with five picks uh, in the first 90 selections of this draft. A reminder, you're listening to the Mets pod uh, subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube. Follow on SMY's social platforms for all our clip outs or wherever you get your podcast. So, Joe, that is not the first time we've gotten to talk to Tommy, but it's definitely uh, the most intense time, I think, as the Mets have two first round picks. This is a different year for the Mets with the draft. And it's not just that. You obviously have the compensation pick for losing Noah Syndergaard as well. So, you covered this event essentially year round with a focus and a lens on the Mets as a whole big picture right now. What do you think is so important for the Mets as they head towards the draft? I think it's very important for the Mets to stay true to what their philosophies are. You know, Tommy did mention it during the interview, yeah. but just because you have the extra picks doesn't mean you need to go outside of what your processes are just because you have the, the ability to do so. Uh, I think having five of the first 90 picks, like you mentioned, allows them the flexibility to do more or less whatever they want. I mean, they can sit back and see, does a player fall out of the top 10 due to signing bonus demands? Or like a situation last year, obviously it didn't work out with Kumar Rocker, but the Mets sat there and basically Kumar Rocker fell in their lap and they took him. And you will often see in the MLB draft, teams not so willing to just take someone that falls because you're often kind of figuring out before the draft who you're focused on what their cost is going to be and that kind of parlays across your whole signing bonus pool when someone falls you basically have like three minutes to decide are we going to blow up our draft plan for this person and a lot of times teams just go, we'd rather not deal with that. So you just take their player. But they're in a position where they could take someone that falls. Uh, they could they could play it straight where they just draft two guys that are worth 11 and 14 and have the extra picks so they could go high upside on day two. 
or they could split it up where they go under slot with 11 or 14 and over slot with the other one. They have a lot of options. They have a lot of flexibility, but I think it's really important that they stay true to what their process are and not deviate from that just for the sake of having more picks. I'm with you all the way. And I think that, you know, something important to keep in mind for those listening, um, the Mets have the third highest bonus pool in this draft. So that does go along with what Joe said. There is flexibility. If they want to draft a guy that might want a little bit more at a different spot, they can save in other areas. So that's why so much strategy comes into play. And you can hear that by talking to Tommy. All right, let's get into the farm system, as we always do at this point of the show, because uh, it's always eventful around Francisco Alvarez, even when it really has nothing to do directly with Francisco Alvarez. Unfortunately for James McCann, back on the IL, uh, somewhat of a significant injury that's going to sideline him for at least a couple weeks here, Joe. And as that injury happens, after the first thought of being, you know, how is McCann, the second thought to a lot of Mets fans is, is this going to lead to the call up to Francisco Alvarez, who is just settling in in his new home in Syracuse right now. He has not played a ton uh, there. He just got the call up for Syracuse right now. So for you, Joe, you've been very, you know, you've been very stern about this. You've stuck to the ground and said, hey, this needs, this is a guy that's 20 years old, needs development. He's not going to go from double A to the majors. Now he's in triple A. I'll bite a small sample size. Does McCann's injury change the Alvarez trajectory anymore? Or does it change anything at all for the Mets catching situation, including the deadline? I think it could be more the latter than the former. I don't know if the Mets will go for that big fish like a Wilson Contreras. I'm sure they'll make the call and see what the price is. Uh, That would be irresponsible if they didn't. But maybe the plan at the deadline could be, let's get a better backup than Patrick Mazika. That's what I was thinking. Like That feels like something that may be a a cost-conscious move. Uh, But as far as Alvarez goes... This isn't going to be popular. This isn't going to be what fans want to hear. I understand the excitement and desire to see the top prospect in the system. If they did call him up, I would be excited. I'd be lying if I would say anything other than that. But excitement and the right thing sometimes don't exactly blend. And, you know, obviously, like you said, very small sample size, but he hasn't exactly raked yet in AAA. I think he's two for 16 to start. So that's correct. Yeah, so he's he's off to a slow start, but he, I have no fear that he will figure it out. There's just been far too many examples of prospects getting brought up a little too early and struggling. And as much as we talk about, you just got to get better than James McCann, or you just got to get better than Dom Smith or J.D. Davis. Let's not lie to ourselves. If Francisco Alvarez came up and hit... 230 and hit a couple bombs people would be complaining about that too so the expectation would be with the way the offense is performing if they called him up he had to be impactful from day one and i don't think he's ready to be an impactful bat right this very second and that shouldn't be taken as a negative he's 20 years old at catcher in triple a this is almost unheard of to have a player at his age at the level he's at being as close to the majors as he is But what's important for the Mets to do, in my opinion, is the long-term development and future of Francisco Alvarez is more important than the production at catcher, specifically in the year 2022. And fans don't want to hear it, but the reality is Francisco Alvarez's long-term development, to me, is of utmost importance, more so than specifically just the catching production within this season. It's going to be, he's going to be a long a big part of the Mets' long-term future here. So let's just make sure he's fully developed and ready to go. I think you have the opportunity, right, Joe, at having a decade-long, and this is not hyperbole, and you can cut me off if you've watched a lot of prospects for a long time, not just in the Mets system but across baseball, a rare opportunity to have a decade-long near all-star catcher with power, a big time arm behind the plate who is developing as a pitch framer. You read the the stories about his work ethic and his demeanor. That is that is rare at this position. You, you see it all the time with guys that play the middle infield or maybe a corner outfield or obviously frontline starters. But at the catching position, that is a pretty rare asset to have. And I think you want to be delicate with that to ensure that you maximize that for eight to 10 years, 
Rather, listen, I want the Mets to win the World Series this year as much as anybody. And if Francisco Alvarez can give them some punch, give them some pop, give them some juice to do that, that would be amazing. But I don't know if I even fully believe, number one, that's fair to him, or number two, they need to do that with this deadline approaching right now. So I think you're thinking big picture. I've been thinking big picture because obviously I do a show with you uh, for a long time now. But that, that has to be the right mindset. And I think the Mets obviously have shown their cards that they're well aware of that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's abundantly clear that as we stand here recording on July 12th, they haven't called him up. They haven't called up Mark Vientos. Uh, so I th- let's go. Yeah. That one, yeah. though, is interesting to me. No, what do you truly a- think it is? I think it. So his ground ball rate is a little higher than they want it to be. His strikeout rate is a little higher than they want it to be, but he's always going to strike out. That's unavoidable. So I think the ground ball rate has given them a, a little more pause uh, at the same time. I just think at this point, like w- you hear a lot of fans talking about, they just need something to help get them to the trade deadline. I don't think top prospects are bridge players. I know mm-hmm. you had mentioned on Twitter last night, do you throw a shot to a guy like a Daniel Palka? Like, Maybe that is something that makes more sense where he's not so much a prospect. He's more of kind of a, you know, a 4A player that maybe yeah. could just get hot, hit a few homers for a couple of weeks, and then you make a trade. But if they didn't call up a prospect two weeks ago, I don't see any reason why they should really consider it now with the deadline. I mean, think about it, right? They finish this Brave series. They have four with the Cubs. Then it's the All-Star break. And then when you come out of the All-Star break, you'll be 10 days from the trade deadline. And we, as we know with the trade deadline, a lot of things do happen on that day specifically, but the 10 days leading up is where the trade market is really hot and when things can actually go down. So we may not be as far away from something coming in as, as you may think. Yeah, I think my argument with Paul is, can he be, you know, a version of Drury or Vogelback, right? Can you find that? And can you find that out now? And if the answer is no, which unfortunately there's a good chance it's not then you look into that tier of player that's not going to cost you, obviously, a top-flight prospect. All right, let's get into the mailbag, as we always do. Plenty of good questions from the listeners. Uh, thanks so much. And if you want to send questions, you could send them to Joe uh, at PSL the Flushing or to me at Connor J. Rogers, both on Twitter. The first one from longtime listener Steve Miller. He said, speaking of the deadline, Joe, how many solid bullpen arms do you think the Mets need to trade for before the deadline? Seems obvious they need at least one. I think they need two plus your typical Sam Clay type flyers. Joe, we've talked about this is one that we, it's not will they, won't they. We know it's going to happen. The Mets are going to add at least a bullpen arm. But do you think this is a bullpen makeover? Or do you think the return of Trevor May on the horizon maybe scales that back down a little bit? On top of Adam Adovino pitching really well for the Mets this year. I would say one for sure a lefty. Like that to me is like the slam dunk. They need to replace Chase and Shreve with, a good left-handed pitcher and Joely Rodriguez has been okay. He's been fine, but a little yeah. bit up and down. I think the, the return of Trevor May is going to be big. Uh, Adam Adovino has pitched really well. Drew Smith is in a bit of a funk right now, but he's been pretty good this year. Seth Lugo feels like it's just, he's either all there or all not there. So I, I don't it's feel like late they, is what yeah, Seth Lugo yeah, is right now. Yeah. And we know about Edwin Diaz. Uh, I don't even need to harp on that. I don't think much anymore. I think everyone's just in there. Well, we're going to go there next, yeah. but keep yeah. going. Okay. I don't think the the bullpen is like bad, right? I think, I think there's some perception that they have a bad bullpen. I don't think that's true. Uh, I do think they need a lefty. And if they could be opportunistic and get a secondary player, like a Michael Fulmer, someone like that, I'm down for that too. Because at the end of the day, when you get to the playoffs – bullpens loom even larger because starters don't get the same leash if you're not pitching great you're getting pulled out of the game early so the bullpen additions are going to be big i would say one for sure two tops yeah i think that makes sense all right another question because i did want to get there you brought up edwin diaz uh brian o'donnell asked if diaz continues to have the season he is having could you see him earning some cy young votes now brian said votes not the award Joe, it's kind of, I wanted to answer this question because I wanted to explore what does it take for a closer to get Cy Young votes in this era of the game? Uh, Be Eric Gagne. Like, I think that's pretty much it. And uh, I don't know that he'll get Cy Young votes and he clearly is not going to be the Cy Young like Eric Gagne was, which 
think how crazy that was. There was that was 2003, that, that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just just think how crazy that was. There was a year that a closer got the award for best pitcher. But Edwin Diaz is pacing right now to have kind of an one one of the best closer seasons ever. I mean, he's missing bats at the most some of the craziest rates you've ever seen. He struck out 51.4 percent of the batters he's faced. Crazy. So. Over half the people are striking out. He's not walking guys like he has historically. He has, you know, knock on wood, not given up many big home runs. Just a couple shots here and there, but he's been fantastic. Whether he gets Cy Young votes or not, I don't know. But the one thing I do know is Edwin Diaz is getting the bag here in the next three months. He's going to, he has the argument, and it's going to be hard to argue against, becoming the highest paid closer in baseball, who right now, on a per year basis is Araldis Chapman with the Yankees, who's making eighteen million dollars a year. So I think if you're talking about an extension for Edwin Diaz, you start at eighteen million dollars a year. Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting. If he continues on this path and replicates his first half in his second half, there's gonna be no doubt his contract at twenty eight years old is gonna be uh colossal. There and you you said it. I mean what he's doing right now in the shortened season in two thousand twenty ironically nobody really talks about this is very similar to what he's doing now probably because it was the shortened season but his strikeout rate is even higher it's over 18 uh 18.1 over nine that was 17.5 over nine that year the era is around the same the closer winning the Cy Young was something that was a little bit more common in the 70s and 80s it is something that is not ever does not happen in this generation like you said Gagne was uh you know the one we think of in 2003 but it just goes to say the fact that we're having this conversation, Joe, and the fact that Brian asked this question for the mailbag today just shows how, I don't know if I want to say rare, but how tremendous of a season Diaz is having. And it feels a little bit more special because of how his Mets career here started. Yeah, that's exact, That's literally exactly where I was going to go with it. So it is a kind of historic type season for a closer. Still has a couple months to, to go through. Because of the K rate, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. The K rate is just crazy. And... You just, like you said, you look at 2019 in the juice ball era, he was not good. He just gave up home run after home run. And Mets fans, it's taken until probably about late June 2022 to kind of let 2019 go. That's like true. that's, that's it's been a that's long true. gap. Because like, they're in I first mean, place. Yeah, it was a couple weeks ago that I would tweet. So that's my thing. I tweet after every save, Edwin Diaz save count with the amount of trumpets for the amount of saves and a little video clip of uh, Narco playing in the background of him. And two weeks ago, there were still people getting my mentions that are saying, yeah, let's see what happens when it's a big game. Like, well, still still don't believe. And look at last night. I mean, he came up against the 3-4-5 of Atlanta and absolutely made them look like minor league players. That's When he's on, that's the, that's the kind of stuff he has. All right, Joe, obviously the Mets have to wrap up the series with Atlanta, a uh, series with Chicago, and then the break. But with the draft on the horizon, closing thoughts from today's episode of the Mets pod. I cannot wait for the draft. Like you said, I do this for months and months at a time, and it all culminates in a quick kind of 72-hour period. And you do it with, when you cover the NFL draft. Yeah, so you totally, flies by you. Yeah, you understand all this work, and it culminates there. It's going to be an exciting and long Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of next week. But big week for the Mets to get through. And, you know, let, let's win this series in Atlanta. And one thing that is for sure, after the win in game one, the Mets cannot leave Atlanta in second place. That's right. All right. Reminder, everyone, to subscribe to the Mets pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.